We have a chance to show us the uh, homework again, like how to do it. Yeah, sure. So um, for the initial registration, uh, you go to the sertel.org. Actually, I think you can go right to ebooks. So ebooks, let me try it. Sertel.org. And so then you've got the student sign up. So student sign up, click, and then um, once you get that, uh, let's see, maybe that is wrong. Do you got to do the sign in? Oh, create a username. Well, you got to create the username password first, right? And then once you do that, you go to the next page where you've got the code that I gave you, the Russ M. Was. Yeah. So, how many people haven't gotten logged in yet? Okay, just a handful of you. So make sure you get that um, done today. Why don't you come up after class and we can get you to make sure you get in. But if you have a general question or problems you're having. Well, like, I was just wondering where to go. <laughs> oh, once you log in, you should have the e-book. Okay, yeah, so that's the book. So that's it. I mean, that, that's, I just wanted you guys to gain access to the book. So then the, the modules that we're doing, so part two was what I uh, suggested you read. Um, so maybe take some notes down on your notes for today. So basically we're doing part two and part three. And so with part two, uh, let me see, uh, the student one is organized a little bit differently. Can I see your boss? Click your little uh, tab. So that, okay, so you've got the modules. So the, along the left-hand side, there's uh, modules. And so what we're doing is part two of the book, which is modules, I want to make sure you get the right number, five, six, and seven. So this is mods five through seven. So along the left-hand side, if you pull up the little thing, those are the sections we've gone through. You'll see the videos that we've already watched. So this is just to get you ac access to the uh, a more, you know, to the written content. And then part three of the book is what we're still working on right now that we'll be finishing up by Friday. Uh, mods eight through 11. So those are the only sections of the book that you got that you have to focus in on, part two and part three. You don't have to worry about the other modules. So basically modules five through seven, and uh, we left off last time, I think on, let me start today. Yeah, we're on mod eight, and we'll be starting with 3.2 is kind of where we're at today. We've got a little bit of eight. So any other questions about the content? So as long as we're on that, let me explain a little bit more on what your, uh, at least part of your assignments, I'm still kind of putting this together, but I know I'm for sure doing this. For each of these parts, they've got a little kind of homework, it's called a quiz, but there's a 10 question quiz for each module. And so part of your homework for this weekend, for this stuff, is going to be to complete this quiz. And so I'll have it uh, uploaded to our Blackboard shell, so you'll have that access. And it'll pretty much be a hunt and peck thing. You know, in theory, you guys read. Some of you will read. Some of you won't read. Um, and then answer these questions. Okay? And then just kind of a multiple choice format. So each of the modules will have a 10-question quiz, and that'll be part of the uh, stuff for this weekend that I'll get uploaded into Blackboard. Yeah, so will we be printing it out and then submitting like a photo of it? Uh, I haven't decided yet. Okay. So it'll be up there in some way, shape, or form. So I'll, I'll think through how I want it to be um, turned in. Okay, but at least now you got that idea. And then you're going to have a test that knowing these questions and working through the content and reading, it'll be a similar type of test uh, on the content as well. Yes. When are our, like our projects going to be? I remember I was looking at the syllabus last night. There's like a big presentation. Right. 
I think I put them in the syllabus, if I remember right, but it'll be towards the, at the end after the content. So yeah, it'll be at the end of the term. I think I maybe even put Monday after we're done with our full class week. Oh, okay. So. Okay, so that gives us our little direction here. Actually, I need to log in myself, don't I? What do I think about it? All right, so um, so today we're continuing on with module eight, and to kind of review, what is the three functions of government we talked about last time? We have three functions of government that should be in your notes. Hopefully, your notes are being circulated around so you guys have your notes. Productive. Last class, protective, productive, productive, and redistributive. And redistribute. So, um, what was the idea of those? So, somebody at the back of the room, what does the protective function mean? What was government's role in providing a protective function for society? What are we protecting? Your personal property. Your personal property. So, we, we kind of spent uh, the previous module, or one of the part two, talking about the importance of personal property and private property, and you guys have the right to own pro property and whatnot. So one of the most important, uh, in my opinion, the most important functions of government is providing protection of your individual rights to own property and use it as you please and all of that stuff, right? So that's why we have police system and court system and, and uh, things that help you um, do what you want to do without infringing on other people's rights to do what they want to do. That was kind of the protective function. All right, so productive. So we can kind of think production. What's the productive, a productive function of government? Go ahead. Development. Development. Development of what? I mean, I, that's a little too broad. I just want to be a little more specific. So the production function of the government, or productive function. Infrastructure, roads and bridges, maybe. Um, you know, they might get involved with providing education. Um, you know, whether or not that's good or not. We talked about the post office. So if the government's producing a good or service, like a private company would, um, or perhaps uh, do, that is a production of something. So one of the classic ones that we definitely need the government involved in, uh, for reasons we usually talk in micro class a little bit more, but we're gonna talk about it here too, is like national defense, right? It might be hard for us to hire a private company to protect our nation, right, the, that we want. So we were gonna have enough people involved and so uh, having all the shared benefits that we get that uh, we enjoy in Kansas and they enjoy in Oregon or Florida or whatever. Um, that common public good is what we call it that we'll get into later uh, today. That is a productive function. So they're producing goods and services of some sort. Um, and then we can talk about well whether they should produce them or not. It's maybe a different question because in the, the stuff we've looked at, we prefer to put stuff in private hands. That's kind of what our country was based on. But what was the main reason that we get some good results from the invisible hand of the market that Adam Smith talked about? What was one of the key things that the private sector has that the government doesn't have that sometimes the government is inefficient with some things? It's their own money. So using your own money, that was part of it. Yep, so if a private person is using their own money, they're going to be more careful with their own money, right? And the decisions that they make. Yes, that was part of it, Bryce. Uh, competition. competition, that's the big C word, right? So if the government controls it and they can force you to pay for it, it really eliminates the competition function, the competition element. And so the competitive function is the thing that keeps the greed in check. If we have greed out there or we keep uh, uh, things... Uh, keep people uh, having the most efficient process possible and uh, the lowest cost and the lowest prices. So competition 
is really the secret sauce of a successful market system in terms of allocating scarce resources to their highest and best use. And when the government takes over the production of something, they don't have that competition because they can force the payment. They can set the rates, right? So we all sort of lose out on the benefits we have with competition. Okay, and then finally, the redistributive function. What's government doing there? Social security. Social security, good. That was an example. Social security, take from the young, give to the old. What other, give me a couple other examples of redistribution. Yes. Take from the rich, give to the poor. Okay. Maybe another one. Medicare, Medicaid. Medicare, Medicaid. Take from the healthy, give to the unhealthy, right? Give to the sick. Take from the employed, give to the unemployed, right? So we've got this um, forcible taking of money. It might be for a good cause because I want to help old people out. I want to help sick people out. I want to help poor people out. The question is, is government the right place to be doing that? Is that the right institution, the right um, the right way to do it? Or could private charity happen, uh, uh, help out, or be a, a sufficient substitute, or maybe even get better results? When we look at private charity, we're back into a market system. Do charities compete with each other for donor dollars? Do charities compete with each other for donor dollars? Absolutely. So what do they do to show that they're doing a good job to their donors and to people who they're soliciting money for? What do they do? What do charities do? What's that, You know? Give shirts. Give shirts, okay. So to induce that, uh, to kind of advertise, maybe the help that they're doing. What else, yeah? Tax breaks. Ta they get, they might get tax breaks. Uh, that would be kind of intermixing government with the tax break thing, part of it, right? But I'm trying to think of what do charities do that are operating just privately, not thinking about government intervention? What do they do to try to get donor dollars? How do they, how does this competition thing work? Show how they give out their money. Show how they give out their money. Be very transparent about it too, right? Do donors care? If you have administrative cost of 50% and 50% goes to the to the to the poor without any shoes, versus another company that maybe does it on 10% administrative fee, you know? So where is my if I give you a dollar, is 50 cents going to a big payroll for some executive? Or is it going to actually the cause that I'm supporting? Right? So all of a sudden we get competition involved in charities and we might get better outcomes with uh, giving. And so maybe that could be a substitute in some places for where we're using the government to help the poor or feed the, you know, help the sick or whatever. Are there market principles that we can shift some of the activities into private hands as opposed to some of the pitfalls we might have with using the government? There's, and there's prob probably a proper blend of government intervention and private hands, right? So that's kind of what we're exploring here is what, uh, what amount of government is, is appropriate. Okay, so that's the three. What is it? Protective. Protective. Productive. Productive and distributed. All right, so that's kind of the three areas that we'll focus on. Um, so section 3.2, um, we don't have a, a video on, and, and this is a little bit more of a microeconomic topic, but it's, it kind of plays on what I just told you, that the government is essentially a monopoly if they can do it through force, if they can control all the resources. Um, if Bernie Sanders would have his way, who would be providing health care? The government, right? And so the government would create a monopoly of health care. Now, maybe there'd be a blending of some private individuals, but otherwise doctors would get their paychecks from the federal government, just like uh, the state university system. The professors are essentially getting their paychecks. So would that be a better way to go, right? Um, that's a debate that's pretty uh, out there right now with, with healthcare. So um, this section talks about whenever we create a monopoly, whether it's government or whether it's a private sector, um, we're starting to eliminate competition, which was our secret sauce to having the market system work in the first place. So it changes incentives. 
when there's only one show in town, um, that cannot, uh, doesn't always lead to good outcomes. Okay, so then um, section 3.3 3 is going to look at two areas that the government can help out on. And so public goods and externalities. So on your notes, if you want to put uh, special interest effects, this is the first video, special interest. And take some notes that you'll turn in like we've been doing. And here we go. Uh oh. Fun fact. As grandfather has strong insights about special interest in this town, why is he so unhappy about the convention center? If the voters or their elected representatives agree to build it, isn't that enough? Well, let's look at what economics has to say about it. Consider the following incentives and what they might imply. Voters have little incentive to inform themselves on candidates and issues. They recognize their vote will not be decisive. Politicians have a strong incentive to cater to well-organized special interest groups. These groups deliver votes, and they provide elected officials with campaign contributions and other forms of support. Corporations, unions, and other special interest groups have a strong incentive to raise and spend money and deliver votes to elect candidates, promising to use government resources to advance their interests. Those groups will also take counteractions to defeat candidates who do not. The political process is short-sighted. It encourages people in office to spend now and postpone the responsibility of addressing the issues associated with debt financing and tax increases into the future. Political allocation encourages sweetheart relations between the politicians and well-organized business and labor groups. The latter will shift resources away from production intended to satisfy consumers into an efforts to obtain grants, subsidies, and other favors from the government. The incentive of government enterprises and agencies to operate efficiently and constrain their spending is weak. As I mentioned in the last section, it's very easy to spend or even overspend other people's money. Bottom line, the political incentive structure indicates even democratic decision making will lead to various types of waste and inefficiency. It also explains why the two political parties often seem to have more in common with each other than they do with their constituents. The framers of the U.S. Constitution recognize the dangers of concentrated power and majority rule. That's why they sought to limit political power and separated the federal government into three branches that would check against each other. The legislative branch passes legislation, the executive branch carries it out, and the judicial branch reviews its constitutionality. The framers also established two legislative branches, one, the House of Representatives, based on population, and the other, the Senate, based on equal representation for each state. Approval for both is necessary for the passage of legislation. The Constitution further limits the powers of the federal government to those specified in Article I, Section 8, and the Tenth Amendment of the Bill of Rights indicates. The powers not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited by it to the states, are reserved to the states respectively or to the people. This structure is designed to limit the powers of the federal government and promote government action based on agreement and the consent of the citizens. With the passage of time, the United States has moved away from limited government and more toward majority rule. Let's take a closer look at what economics has to say about how the political process works and its implications for constitutional restraints. <laughs> Okay, what'd you get out of that one? Danger and concentrated power. Good. That, that, and that's kind of the whole monopoly thing. Like, we're always worried about, oh, Google's going to rule the world or Amazon's going to rule the world. And so that's an example of where one person, Jeff Bezos, is starting to have some economic power. He's, uh, last time I checked, he's, his net worth is around 130 or $140 billion. So he's a big time billionaire. So the wealthiest person on the planet, I believe, is, is Jeff Bezos with Amazon. So does he have a lot of economic power, the power, the command to buy things? Yeah, and how did he get it? By selling things, which is kind of interesting with the rise of Amazon, right? So, um, you know, what would keep Bezos in check. What keeps his power in check? Regulation? 
I would say no, by the way, on regulation. Competition. Competition. From who? eBay. eBay. Walmart. Walmart. Target. You go down the list, right? So now he's been very successful at serving the consumer, but it wasn't unchecked, right? He had market discipline that was cracking the whip of him continuing to innovate and come out with ways, and his reward was $140 billion so far and growing, right? So it was all voluntary. Um, should we, we get to the point where we might look at regulation if he is not uh, respecting property rights in the right way. So historically, if um, a person was getting really big, they could go buy Walmart, buy Target, buy, you know, buy up all their competition so that they control the market, right? That's where regulation might be looked at. Um, but in a case where there's lots of competition, the government's not gonna step in to regulate it, nor should they. Uh, it's okay to be rich in the United States, right? Now we might have tax rates and we might have a tax the rich proportionately higher, which I totally favor by the way, uh, having higher tax rates of tax for the rich as opposed to the poor. We already have that in place. What was the highest tax rate for the United States? 39.5 at the federal level. Believe me, Jeff Bezos is in that. Well, that, that gets a little deeper than we want to go, but in yeah. some cases, in some tax years, he might be able to do some Mickey Mouse accounting that drops him into a lower tax bracket. So um, that that's possible. But in theory, whatever that reasoning was, if he's reinvesting back into his company, for instance, um, then that can grow the value of Amazon and cause his income to be less. It'd just be no different than you guys making $100,000 and living off 20,000 of it, and you invested 80,000 of it, right? So if you had an expense that year of 80,000, your taxable income might only be 20. So you can do some shuffling of expenses in different years to kind of change your tax liability. So of course, uh, rich people do that, and as they should, they're, as long as they're following the rule of law, they're not doing it deceitfully or anything, then that's great. If they're doing it because they played kissy face with President Trump and other Congress people out on the golf course, am I for that? No, absolutely not. That's not capitalism. That's not market-based discipline. That is using the law, right? What did we call it last time? It was kind of a weird word that pirates plunder. plunder. So if Bezos is able to play kissy face with the government and have laws in his favor to erect barriers to competition and create a monopoly or at least have barriers to entry and reduce competition, that's not capitalism. That's not the market system. We don't want that. We should have a good rule of law with the government that politicians aren't allowed to play kissy face with big business and alter and change. Now, our current system is somewhere in there doing that though. Right? And so maybe we need, we have problems with the current system that we need to look at. That's part of what we're going to continue to explore in this chapter. All right, questions or comments there? I wanted to highlight the three branches for a sec. Um, is it specialization or competition? Those are kind of two different things. So what are the three branches? Executive. Executive, which is who in the United States? President. President. Legislative. Legislative and judicial. judicial. So we've got the three branches. Part of that could be to like specialize. Hey guys, we're gonna run the government. I'll handle the I'll handle the court system. You know, I'll handle the military, and you handle the changes in uh, laws and, and taxes. Right? It's kind of like a specialization, like we did with comparative advantage. Part of economics was uh, specialization. To some degree, that's true, but I don't think the framers of the Constitution had that in mind. I think they were trying to introduce a little bit of competition, a little bit to some degree. So the specialization is true, but the checks and balances that one branch can't go out and do something, they might be held accountable from the judicial branch to say, was that constitutional or not? If Trump goes and builds a wall, for instance, that was kind of the recent one, uh, or the ban, uh, the Muslim ban 
uh, did get upheld. So Trump lost that. It got appealed. It went to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court said it was constitutional, right? So it was checks and balances was part of, I think, the framers' idea of having the three branches. It was specialization to some degree, but also to establish some checks and balances on the human beings that would actually be in these positions of power, the president and Congress, to make changes. So, uh, comments, questions there? Andrew, challenge? Or a comment? I, uh, bring no. it on. No, I, no, I don't mean bring it on to like, fight me or anything, but <laughs> I want you guys to be thinking well, critically so, about this. Uh, uh, so. uh, 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 recent upholding for the Supreme Court all of Trump challenging these long, long party lines by four or five for the conservative uh, judges to work for the conservative liberal judges. Yeah, and in theory, we don't have judges that are Republican or Democrat, right? right. In theory, we have unbiased, you know, good track record, people who have had been in there. But yes, certainly the conservativeness with judges typically falls in uh, judges who are quote unquote conservative are generally constitutionalists. Yeah. So they're the judges that say what we did in 1776 meant something and the documents that were early and we're trying to hold tight to that. That's what I believe my job is. The liberal judges are more of like, well, times are changing and we got to kind of go with the flow as we progress through time. And so the Constitution is a little bit more malleable. That's usually the designation between conservative and liberal in the judicial branches. So, and yes, it's true with uh, Trump's latest appointment, it kind of tilted the, a little bit more towards the constitutional uh, conservative range for the, for the current Supreme Court judges. Okay, let's uh, do the next one here. So this one is on uh, externalities. And some of you in micro have already seen this one, but it's kind of fun to talk about how laws maybe uh, should take into account this possibility. Not a potato chip. Not a potato chip. But it's an externality. So I'll write the word down here. Externality. You externality is where transactions between two people, art and many, has an effect on a third person. Carl, without Carl's permission. Suppose Art sells Benny some potato chips. Now Benny really likes potato chips. She opens the bag, she's looking forward to eating the chips. Oh, she eats those chips. Yum, 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 yum. Just look at her. She loves it. No matter how loud she is, there is no externality unless someone like Carl is there to hear Obviously, Art benefits from selling the products, and Betty benefits from buying the products, since this exchange was voluntary. It was affected by a negative externality. Uh, he's harmed. He didn't get uh, anything. He has to listen to all that. Uh, so it takes three to have an externality. A seller, a buyer, and at least one additional person who is not voluntarily a participant in the transaction. In a previous video, I claimed that prices can tell people the right thing to do. But if there are externalities, do prices tell us everything we need to know? The answer must be no, because with externalities, the price of something and its actual cost are different. The price is the amount they paid to art, but the cost is the amount they paid to art plus the cost to Carl of having many potato chips in his beer during class. The problem with externalities is that prices do not capture all of the costs of the transaction. Now, instead, some of the costs are borne by people who never gave their permission. It seems like the solution would be to try to adjust price so that it coincides with the total cost. For many people, that means fix it with taxes. In other words, impose a tax equal to the difference between the market price and the true cost to force the buyer and the seller to bear the full cost of this transaction. This is what economists call internalizing the cost. We may not need to resort to government action, of course. One way we solve externality problems is called manners. If Carl tells Betty her crunching is bothering him, she'll probably apologize and stop. But there's bargaining, a solution proposed by R.H. Coase. If Carl complains, 
Betty might make a side payment, sharing her chips with Carl. Once Carl's punching you, there are no externalities, only chips. Even if these solutions don't work, it may not be easy to fix it with taxes through state action. Remember, the problem is information. Prices don't contain the full information about costs. But where can accurate information be obtained? How can the state be expected to acquire more accurate information and then act on it effectively? The most interesting answer to these questions came from the original scholar to propose fixing it with taxes, A.C. Boudou. Boudou was a really smart guy who understood that guessing at the correct tax would be very difficult. Back in 1920, Boudou said, it is not sufficient to contrast the imperfect adjustment of unfettered enterprise with the best adjustment that economists in their studies can imagine. For we cannot expect that any state authority will attain or even wholeheartedly seek that ideal. Such authorities are liable alike to ignorance, to sexual pressure, and to personal corruption by private interests, a loud voiced part of their constituents, if organized for votes, may easily outweigh the whole. The fix it with taxes solution often has unintended bad consequences. The government has a knowledge problem, just like everybody else. Every economic team learns about externalities and Genovian taxes, but professors rarely mention how hard Pigou himself thought it would be to get those taxes exactly right. All right, get your notes down. Okay, so in the market system, get back a little picture from before, right? We're having an exchange of goods and services. We got dollars flowing over to businesses, pizza and chicken wings and beer coming to the households. These guys are exchanging down here. So that's kind of our general market system that needs these laws that we're talking about. So what was the problem in regard to property rights with the video? So you can exit, give me, uh, fill me in with the potato chip part. Let me go to the back of the room here. What was it with regard to property rights? What was the real problem? Yeah, the lady smacking on the chip. So what, in the form of property rights, like what was being violated, so to speak, with the chips? And the lady and the guy and the potato chips. In terms of property rights, you know, what was wrong? Who had a right to what? Or, you know, what's the deal? You had a right to the chips. Okay, she has, uh, uh, she's got the right to the chips because there was a market exchange from Frito Lay, right? So Frito Lay or Walmart got the money. So that was the market exchange between Betty and Walmart. So she had the right to eat the chips. So now what was the problem? What property rights were going on there that created the problem that we call an externality? Let me go, let me go over here. Thanks, Hugo, you got the last one. That's good. Yeah, there you go. Smacking your lips to uh... Smacking her lips too loud. So what, what was the deal with property rights though? What, where, talk, talk to me in terms of property rights. We had the smacking lips. That's what Carson had too. Okay, yeah. Do, do, does, does, what was his name in the video? Mark or Ray? Ray? Carl. Carl, yeah. I thought he was crunchy Carl. So, so Carl has some sort of rights to possibly be quiet or to not be interfered. Like, could have that have been interfering with something he was doing? Right? If you guys are doing an exam or homework or uh, you're in the quiet area in the library, right? <laughs> do you have a property right to silence in the library? What do you guys think? Do you have that kind of right here at our library to not be perfectly silent, but there's a reasonable expectation that it's going to be quiet in the library? Do you guys feel like you have that right? So economists would call that a property right. Now, do you have that same right in the cab? No, right? So you don't have that same element. So 
uh, property rights can come from expectations and culture. Um, could be that we have a right, we might have rules that says, you know, be quiet. I don't know, if, do we have any signs posted, be quiet in the library or is there anything? No, I mean, it's just kind of, we've kind of grown up culturally in the United States. If you're in a library, you're being respectful of other people that might want to quiet. That's why you guys go there, right? So it's kind of this collective public good of the library as being a, a relatively quiet space that you can go do your studies in. So we've established a property right. And so with the film, an externality happens when somebody's rights are being infringed. Okay. What was the internalized part? What happened kind of towards the end of the video where without the government stepping in, um, the externality kind of, the externality problem went away. What did she do? Offered the chips. Offered the chips. Shared the chips. So now he didn't pay for the chips. She owned the chips. So the property rights were well established. There was this cultural norm of disrupting his silence, that problem disappeared by her being able to have a market transaction, if you will, of sharing the trip chips. She had the right to give her chips away. So he got the chips for free to compensate for the noise and the problem disappeared. So government intervention wasn't needed if we were able to better define the property rights. And that's kind of the message here that we uh, might not need to turn to the government in every case of a problem, but rather maybe we need to redefine uh, property rights in some way, shape, or form. We talked about overfishing, um, that we might be able to have the permits that are tradable uh, for ocean fishing that might help protect our populations of wildlife. We do the same thing here with hunting deer and, and fish and stuff um, in Kansas. Okay, so um, good on externality. What was the problem, lastly, of the government stepping in to solve the problem? When government intervened, what was the big problem you kind of highlighted in the film that gets often overlooked? Uh, the civilian tax and uh, sometimes uh, or not enough information. Not enough information is the key thing, right? Yeah, what is it? Prices don't contain accurate information. Like okay, so prices not having the accurate information. The solution was to for government to somehow augment that price problem with a tax. By the way, it can go the other way too with a subsidy. So the government's intervening with money to try to equalize that equation. But the knowledge problem is the one that often gets overlooked. And many other econ classes, by the way, around the nation um, might be overlooking this because it's kind of standard textbook, like, oh, just set the tax equal to the externality and you solve the problem. That's what he was challenging here is that other economists would say, there's no way you can have enough information. Can we really measure Carl's angst and upsetness from the potato chip crunching? Who knows that the best? Carl does, right? And so even an outside observer, if we go and get, take a survey from Carl, we say, Carl, on a scale of zero to 10, like how much does this hurt you? Is that information really meaningful to be able to do a pricing decision with precision? No, it's not even close, right? And so we have a big time knowledge problem when we try to have um, the government step in to analyze it. Uh, it's what Hayek from our video, uh, which we'll get back to those videos here at some point too. I've got at least one more to show you. Uh, Hayek versus Keynes, right? Who was the government intervention guy, Hayek or Keynes? Keynes. So John Maynard Keynes, Keynesian economics was, let's use government to do it. Hayek was, leave the market alone. Well, Hayek's the one that said, the reason why government intervention won't work is because we have this knowledge problem. It's, it's very difficult for the government to make really accurate decisions on quantities and prices of altering the market system. And so um, government should be something that helps uh, keep competition alive is one of an important function of government, um, which is part of its, what do you think? If, if government is there to try to help encourage competition, would that be them using their protective, productive, or redistributive function? Redistributive? If we're just kind of helping 
people say these are the boundaries of what you what you can and can't do and we don't want people to have you know big clubs to beat off the competition what are they doing protective yeah it's the protective function again so that would be um you know hayek would be supporting the government having a really strong good presence of the protective function let's have good police uh good court system good uh stuff like that to help uh, the market figure out what it wants to do. Leave the thinking to private individuals and just the kind of the bumpers and the laws to the government. Okay, uh, let's see, I wanted to go back to this. So part of what we're uncovering is that economics doesn't disappear when we turn things over to the government. We can think about political markets. And so to kind of highlight the differences here for political markets which is what we're highlighting uh, there's an exchange going on between essentially government function government agents whether they be politicians or bureaucrats employees of the government and business private businesses and private households right so we got households and businesses what are they paying with votes campaign contributions Right? And these guys are providing public policy goods and proposals of what we think society should look like. And so our system has a trade or an exchange of, of a different sort going on that we usually refer to the political markets. And so the question that we're exploring in this content is to say, do political markets give us efficient outcomes that we hope they would in a democratic process or otherwise? And what we're seeing here is that sometimes, uh, depending on what the incentives are, um, it might not work as well as we'd hope it would if we had angels running the government. Okay, uh, let's go here. Comments or questions there? Going on to the next video. That one, here we go. Okay, so political voting versus market allocation. So political voting versus market allocation. Let's say you design a policy that takes one penny from a million people. And it gives that $10,000 to one person. Who's going to know about this policy? Are any of the million going to notice eventually the guy who gets $10,000? I'm Ben Sommel, professor of economics at Suffolk University. Here we have politicians promising to cut spending, which voters generally want, but that's a dispersed thing. When they actually pick the specific programs, that's a concentrated cost. Let's do some real back of the envelope calculations. There's roughly 300 million people in the United States, roughly half of them registered to vote, that's 150 million. If half of them show up in any given national election, that's about 75 million. For your vote to change the outcome of an election, it will have to be exactly 37,500,000 to 37,500,000, and you showing up at the polls makes it 37,500,000 and one to the outcome, so you actually get a different result. What's the likelihood of that happening? Near zero. In fact, economists have figured out you're more likely to die in a car accident on the way to the polling place than to change the outcome of a major national election. As a result, voters are massively ignorant of the policies and the politicians, and it makes sense. But a lot of interest groups are very well informed about policies. Not all of their politicians' policies, but those policies that specifically affect them. Farmers who get farm subsidies have a big incentive to know which politicians support their subsidies and how much they're getting. As a result, they don't really know about it, but give money to the campaigns to help these people get elected and make sure they stay in favor of the favorite subsidies. Meanwhile, spread across the human cost of an average American. It's a trivial amount of money, so most Americans don't even know or feel this cost. And if they do, they hear some general ad on television that talks about how the farmers are good for America. And they feel good about this education policy. These same interest groups that lobby to get their benefits lobby to keep their benefits. This is the logical politics. And this is why we end up with more spending than the average voter usually wants.
So there's a couple different things going on in the video. I want to hear from you guys. What was your big takeaway from that one? That made me like, ah, I never really thought about that. Or something interesting. Only half the population, not that they're able to vote. Uh, yeah, some of that would include babies and stuff too. When we look at 300 million, so that was part of it. The registered voters would be the of age people. So, but not able to vote, but when he cut it in half, what was he saying? That actually do vote. Just, just the fact that they don't show up to the polls, right? So, and then if they, did, why don't they show up to the polls? Don't believe their vote yeah, don't believe their vote counts. So we have a one over, uh, what was the odds that they said that your vote would actually count? And they really did do that. But yeah, okay, yeah, you got the, the, the millions, but what was the comparison to? You were more likely to get hit by a car, or more like, yeah, it was more like a giant car accident than you were. And the team, uh, yeah, go ahead, what is it? It's on the way to vote. On the way to vote! So not only dying in a car accident, your, your chances of dying in a car accident are actually higher than that. But dying in the car accident on the way to go to vote, you have a bigger chance of that happening than your vote counting. So despite what MTV tells you to rock the vote and your vote counts and your vote matters, I hate to break the news to you, no matter. It don't matter. Your vote isn't going to matter. There's not been one national election where it's come down to that one vote. So why don't people vote? Well, if they kind of perceive that their vote don't count or they're disinterested in the policies, you know, they're like, okay, whatever. What are we doing with health care? I don't give a damn. I just want to go to work and, you know, pay my bills, right, live my life follow my own self-interest. Nothing wrong with that. So he didn't say it, he used the word ignorant, but he didn't use rational ignorance, uh, rational ignorance is what, which is a concept in economics that we have in our textbook. Rational ignorance. So what does it mean to be ignorant of something? Are you stupid if you're ignorant? Lack of knowledge. Lack of knowledge, so you're uninformed. So truly ignorance is not stupidity. Ignorance is that you're uninformed. It's just something you didn't know about. <coughs> what does the word rational mean? If you're ra if a person is rational about a decision they made, what did they do? They reasoned it out, what, Kim? Thought about it, maybe looked at the data, did a little research, spent some time, right? So they did what we like uh, to think uh, people do is analyze the stuff, do a cost-benefit analysis, right, and reason it out. So now catch this. So we got thinking, and we've got ignorance. So rational ignorance all together. What does it mean to be rationally ignorant? And I'll just tell you, I'm rationally ignorant on a lot of stuff. I love it. It's good to be rationally ignorant. You'd almost be stupid if you weren't rationally ignorant, which is kind of weird to think about. But what does it mean to be rationally ignorant? So rational, we thought about it, we used reason, you know, we did this concern, but yet we're... So is it like you're thinking, about, you're rationally thinking about something you don't want to do? Um, no. Or that you don't want to know. So like if somebody's like, if you're going to say something that you just don't want to hear, like I just don't... I don't okay, know. good. So that's kind of the right thing, is, is choosing not to learn about something. Why would you choose to not learn about the national health care debate? It's boring. How much time would you have to spend to really be informed about the issues regarding health care? Just take a just take a stab. Hours, 10 hours, 20 hours, 40 hours. I mean, could you write some research papers and all that, right? We got specialists in the field. So if you were to stay really informed on it, maybe you'd be doing a lot of time now. How many of you, with a show of hands, let's just say that if you spent 10 hours, you'd get reasonably informed. I'm talking about really 10 hours of solid research, learning about national health care issues. 10 hours. How many of you would have something better to do with your life, with a show of hands, than doing 10 hours doing that? You might be interested. There might be a couple people, right? If it's in your own self-interest, you might want to do that. You care about health care or something else. But the vast majority of you raised your hand. You're rationally ignorant. 
you maybe never thought about it that way, but you're saying, if I learn about the issues, I'll be informed. Then when I go to the voting booth, stay with me, when I go to the voting booth, I'll be able to vote the way I know the issues and vote for one candidate or the other. So then hopefully that'll help me get my policy the way I think the world should look done. But now what's the probability of your vote counting to get your thing the way you wanted it? Close to zero. That's rational ignorance, right? So if you look at, let's say this policy means a lot to you that healthcare might save your family a hundred dollars or let's say a thousand dollars per year. Like it's important monetarily. Like if Bernie Sanders got his healthcare thing, I would save a thousand dollars. And so I'm going to learn about healthcare, make sure I'm really sure <laughs> that Bernie's the right way to do it. Spend my 10, 20, 30 hours worth of time. I have an expected positive outcome of a thousand. But in economics, when we talk about what's the uh, value, the expected value of that, you take that times the probability of getting it, of making a difference. You would have to be the one that tilts that 37 and a half million scale, which is probability of a better chance of getting dying, not just getting in a car wreck, dying in a car wreck on the way to the voting booth. So that's like what, I don't know, one over 10 trillion or something? There's your probability, 0. 0.000000000. Whatever I take that probability times a thousand, that gives me about a penny, a penny worth of expected value for being informed. Would I rather be watching 10 hours of Netflix? Would I get more than a penny's worth of benefit? Yes, right? A value for doing that. So that's what breaks down our system is that it's pretty well known that in a democratic system, if you have fully informed voters, fully informed voters that actually go to vote, then you'd have a reasonable expectation that we'd get better outcomes for society on average with, with uh, different policies. But we're missing both of those things when we have rational ignorance. So rational ignorance is a public choice theory. Public choice is kind of an area of economics that that's one of the things discussed uh, in addition to these political markets and some of the other things that we're doing. Rational ignorance. So now you can be proud of your ignorance if it was rational and you kind of understood like this is a waste of time learning about this policy. Uh, but some of you might, uh, depending on you know how it impacts, you might be able to do that better, do that differently. Okay, questions or comments? All right, next video. Let's see, you can put, uh, so this is, this is still under political voting and market allocation. So let's put uh, Stossel Steel. This is the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence. Together they're this thin. This tiny booklet created the conditions America needed to give 300 million people freedom and prosperity. However, our political leaders always believe they can improve on this, so they keep adding pages of rules. These are some of their rules. They are just the rules a toy maker has to understand and obey. Thousands of pages. Now I assume, assume these rules are well intended, but many are a useless waste of time and money. And many give companies an advantage over others. These rules foster crony capitalism. Crony capitalism thrives because we've gotten away from this. We've given politicians and bureaucrats unbelievable power to write and rewrite the rules of the game. So not surprised that they help their friends along the way. Both parties do it. When George W. Bush was president, the steel industry demanded protection from foreign competition. Without it, they said, Americans will suffer. The door would be open to run this industry out of business. Foreigners had the nerve to want to sell a steel that was cheap. Big steel lobbied Washington, and the president responded. We look forward to working with you to do what's right for the steel workers and the steel industry of America. What's right for the steel industry 
turned out to be a 30% tariff. As a result, businesses that were less well connected, like this casings manufacturer that had to pay more for steel, suffered. We estimate that in the first year of the tariffs, it cost us over a million dollars off our bottom line. The politically connected tire industry also got protection. Imports were hit with a 35% tax. Yet politicians had the nerve to say it was about maintaining an open and free trading system. But what about you consumers who want to pay less for steel and tires? Who cares? You don't have a lobby. Okay. So that video, um, I, I wrote it down and then I erased it. Um, with concentrated benefits and dispersed costs. So write that down on your paper under this video heading and we'll add on a little bit of that. Concentrated, concentrated benefits, and dispersed cost. So, uh, from the video, what was he saying about there being an example of concentrated benefits and dispersed costs? Who got the benefits? The steel producers, right? So we had steel producers who were getting concentrated benefits, um, some sort of uh, protection from tariffs, and this could come in the form of subsidies or laws or other things too. But we got concentrated benefit. What's the dispersed cost part? To the consumers. And so what's going to happen to consumers? They're going to pay more for steel or steel products, which might mean that the cost of this clip, these are kind of expensive clips and big ones, but you know, this might have been a dollar thirty-five, and now it's going to be a dollar thirty-seven. Does that get me outraged as a consumer? Yes. Two cent increase? Am I even going to know? No. Right? That's the problem with having government intervention into or can be a problem of government intervention in the market, is that when we start doing, well, by the way, would that be the uh, protective function, productive function, or redistributive function? With the steel little video thing here. Protective? protective? If you're right, it's protecting something, but it's not the one that falls under the protective function. It's redistributive. From who to who? Consumers paying a dollar thirty-seven instead of a dollar thirty-five for steel, but I'm just one out of three hundred million. So now, if you take those two cents times three hundred million, it's a significant amount of money going to the steel producers, right? So we have concentrated benefits and dispersed costs. And that's a redistributive function that the government is playing there. Um, the protective function, just to kind of be clear, applies to everybody's rights. So in this example, another way to think about it is why is that not the protective function? Who are they not protecting? The consumer. Right? So when we do the protective function, it's protecting kind of the general uh, rights of all of the individuals in terms of the protective function. Okay, any other last comments on that video? All right, I got another one here. Oh, I wanted before I did that, so he mentioned the word crony capitalism. If you can put cronyism in there, that's a theme that is part of public choice. And if you can write in your notes, Big business, big government, kissy face. That's cronyism. That's crony capitalism. That's why I say it so often here. So big, and it's not capitalism. That's why he called it crony capitalism. But I hate to use that word because we've kind of drifted to calling it cronyism because that's not capitalism. So big government, big business, kissy face. Kissy, I don't think I've ever written this out. Kissy face. 
I'm putting K I S S Y. I don't know, like somebody, E Y or something. You can spell it however you want. So having um, this legal plunder concept, and that's what this next video is going to start on here. This is on uh, Windows. You can call this video Windows if you want. He says crony capitalism. What's he talking about? Well, suppose you're in the window business. How do you get a leg up on the competition? Sure would help if government gave you a special tax credit and gave your customers stimulus money to buy your products. Would help even more if somehow you could get the president and the vice president of the United States to say nice things about your company. But come on, that's not possible, is it? No company could be that fortunate. There are three big companies in the window business. Pellant, Anderson, and Martin. Marlin windows and doors with your vision. The recession's been tough on these companies. But then there's also a much smaller company, Serious Materials. Serious is moving, according to this article in Fortune, on a roll, according to Inc. magazine, which puts Sirius as CEO in its cover, with a story titled, How to Build a Great Company. How did he do it? Well, he had some help from high places. Thank you, Mr. Vice President, uh, for your unwavering support. That's Vice President Biden is thinking. Without you and the Recovery Act, this would not have been possible. Biden returned the compliments. You're not just churning out windows. You're making some of the most energy efficient windows in the world. I would argue the most energy efficient windows in the world. Other window makers say, no, our windows are just as energy efficient. But the Vice President hasn't visited their companies or even mentioned their names. And why am I talking about the Vice President? I'm here today representing serious materials. How many company officials get to make introductions like this? It is my distinct honor to introduce the President of the United States, President Barack Obama. The President gave a speech on energy policy that cited as which company. Serious materials just reopened, as he mentioned, manufacturing plant outside of Pittsburgh. These workers will now have a new mission, producing some of the most energy efficient windows in the world. Why? What a dream endorsement. And just last week, the president announced a new set of tax credits for so-called green companies. The only window company on the list? Serious materials. This is a story of how a new economy predicated on innovation and efficiency is not only helping us today, but in inspiring a better tomorrow. Actually, I think it's a story about crony capitalism. It's almost as if the government and serious materials are partners. The company VP of Policy testified in Congress. Thank you for the opportunity to appear here today and share serious materials experience in creating green jobs. And here he is in this picture with so-called energy leaders at the U.S. Department of Energy. And who's the woman in the middle? Kathy Zoy, who oversees the government's weatherization program. She has big plans for your tax money, she explained in a commentary. Where literally SWAT teams go into neighborhoods and they retrofit every single house and every single business on Main Street. Oh, and I left out a little fact. Kathy Zoy is the wife of the vice president of policy of Sirius Windows. So of all the window companies in America, maybe it's a coincidence that the one that gets presidential, vice presidential attention and a special tax credit is one where company executives give thousands of dollars to the Obama campaign, and where the policy director spends nights at home with the energy department's weatherization boss. It could be coincidence, and there's apparently nothing illegal about this. In Kathy Zoy's ethics agreement, she did disclose her marriage. It says she would recuse herself from any matter that had a predictable effect on her financial interests. But it sure looks funny to me. And it's odd that even the liberal media has so much interest in this one company. Vice President Biden says the stimulus bill's funding for making buildings more energy efficient is expected to drive up demand for the kinds of windows made by serious materials, which has caused the company to ramp up its production. That's how it works. Economic stimulus. Ta da Ta-da is right. That is how it works. But government handouts that go to one favorite company, why is that right? Okay, get your comments down. The 
this particular video looked at uh, Obama and Biden support here, but do you think that kind of happened with maybe George Bush? Did it happen maybe with Trump? Does that type of thing happen in other places? Yeah, this, this is going beyond party lines, right? So that is one of the, I think, the biggest dangers of um, in our country is having this cronyism. We need to have a good protective function um, so that we don't have stuff like that happen. So, uh, okay, so video comments. Let me go and come to you guys here first. We come to the back of the room. What'd you get? Your manual? What'd you put? You're not sleeping, are you? Okay. They partnered with the company. So, um, it wasn't a legal partnership, by the way, right? So it wasn't uh, uh, somehow the government and, uh, and them were um, you know, being bought or something, or shares, right? It wasn't a story like that. Uh, in other countries, that does happen, um, where uh, communist China has a lot of that, where the government wants to be a part of it. Like, you can come to our country and do your thing, but we're going to be a 51% shareholder. So it's possible that other countries could have policies where um, the government relationship with the private businesses is really tight in terms of even ownership. But here it was just support, right? So having it uh, be supported somehow um, with a special guest speaker or whatever. Uh, other, one more comment from the video. Emmanuel, give me a number between uh, three and ten. One, two, three, four, five. Uh -huh. Uh, I just kind of wrote down something about like the Nancy and uh, government and like they uh, favor. A little bit of favoritism, anyway, right? Um, not necessarily monetary handouts, but some sort of uh, favoritism is what cronyism is getting at. So that can come in a large uh, variety of ways. Um, it might just be as simple as, as like the endorsements that we just heard. Um, Okay, so when does the app, let's do a little quiz here. When the average voters don't pay too close attention to details of politicians' proposals, it's an example of rational ignorance, political allocation, or market allocation. When voters don't pay too close attention to politicians' proposals. A, B, or C? A, right? So when we're not paying attention to it, um, it might be for a very good reason. We're not stupid, we're just choosing to be ignorant. Okay, good. Um, so next section is going to focus in on special interest groups. So this is a short little video. You can just put special interest if you want. How far in debt is the U.S. government? Let's put the numbers in perspective. This is the economy of Germany. The entire economic output of this country is about $3 trillion a year. This is the amount of money the federal government has borrowed from the Social Security and Medicare trust funds, about $4 trillion. Here's China's economy. Here's Japan's economy. Here's the amount of money the federal government has borrowed from private citizens and from other countries, about $9 trillion. Here's our economy. Here's unfunded Social Security obligations. This is an amount of money that the federal government has promised to current and future retirees for which it does not have money, and that includes future expected tax revenues. Here's the European Union. Here's unfunded Medicare obligations. These are promises of medical care the federal government has made to current and future retirees, which it cannot cover. Here is the total debt and unfunded obligations. This is the total amount of money the federal government either has borrowed or has promised to pay other people. At $65 trillion, it outstrips the economic output of the entire planet. Okay, so I think the main takeaway there is the unfunded part. So in your notes, make sure you put unfunded obligations, unfunded obligations, unfunded debts, basically. So then my question is, what's 
interests and unfunded debt. He kind of said it in the video, maybe a little quick, but this is the section. This is where we're getting into some overlap of the stuff that we'll do for mod 82 when we get back into our text. So, yeah, they promised ones that they don't have a way to pay immediately. Yeah. Um, not even immediately. So that so you're right. Promised funds, we don't have it, so we couldn't pay it immediately. Um, so it's not like we're behind. Uh, how should I say? We can make the obligation today. So when we look at somebody who's bankrupt, you have illiquid and uh, basically um, unfundable, or you, you can't. Uh, you've got a cash flow problem. So we're able to meet our obligations today, but based on future projections, we can't make those promises under the current system. So what is unfunded? What did he, he had them on the list kind of, and there's probably a big looming one that we'll talk about for sure later. Dakota? Social Security. So it's known as the Social Security time bomb. Um, the Social Security system runs out in 2038, I think is the last uh, estimate that I saw. So what that means is we don't have the funds projected to be able to make that. So we, we make assumptions on um, income and population and growth of the United States. And so the current structure today, let's call it today versus tomorrow. So today is 2019 or 2020 now. 2020. And I think it's 2038, but don't hold me to it. We basically are saying, suppose we're at $20 trillion of GDP, which is our income, right? And if the economy keeps growing at 2 to 3%, we'll make some projections that GDP in 18 years, maybe we'll be up to, let's just say, again, I'm just making up some numbers here, 40 trillion, right? So we'll be up there if we had 3% growth using the rule of 70, by the way. 70 divided by 3% growth would give us that. Remember how we did those exercises with projecting growth? So they're doing the same thing. And then we also have the population and the aging population. Are old people tending to live longer or shorter nowadays? Longer. longer. And 18 years later, will health care probably improve so that they live even longer? Yeah. Probably, yeah, right? So if they're normally uh, uh, dying at around 85 or whatever the mortality rate is now, but it, usually if you make it to age 50, your odds of making it to 85 are really good, even though our overall death probability is around 74, 76. Um, but if you make it that far, well now, 18 years from now, who knows what medicine's gonna look like? Maybe that 85 year old will live to 95, right? So they're kind of looking at all of that complexity and they're basically saying the current system expires. It don't work. It's unfunded before here. So we don't have enough money set up to be able to make that work. And so we've got obligations to seniors. We've got obligations to you guys, by the way. I know it's hard to imagine your guys is like 18 years from now, but right now as an American citizen, I know not everybody in here is American citizen, but as an American, your social security deal was you're going to be putting in money from your paycheck and then at the end you're going to get some payment back. And the way it's looking now is you guys shouldn't plan on that. The system's going to change. They're either going to raise the retirement age, which they've already done multiple times, so they're going to have to change some variables on you uh, to make it funded. So that'll be kind of, the, we'll get into even more details on our fiscal policy chapter on that. Okay, questions, comments? All right, um, let's see, this is just a short little example of that. I'm gonna skip that, there we go, 308. Uh, let's see, we can call this the uh, framers and factions. Framers and factions. What can I do for you today? I would like to raise my dialogue. Excuse me? My dialogue, I'd like to raise it. Because the last time I checked, Mr. Smith, you were in serious debt. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty bad. I think we should raise that limit. Yeah, it says here you're $140,278 in debt. Right, so I figured we should raise that limit to about $170,000. I just thought it was 60 inch flat screen. Have you ever been to Australia? No, I've never. Leave it tomorrow, mate. 
You should check it out. Great car sound. Do you have some new income yet? I don't know what. Ah, uh, no, I'm still making about 21 grand a year. Okay. And are you still spending $38,000 a year? That's what it says. So you're adding $17,000 a year in debt. Oh, that limit going up. Ding. Have you made any cuts in your expenses? Oh, of course, yes. Uh, my wife and I cut $380 out of our annual budget. $380 world. Huh. So you're, you're, you're making, you're adding, okay, so you're adding $17,000 a year to your $130,000 in debt, and you cut $380. Hey, maybe you should think about generating some new income, maybe a uh, new job, maybe ask for that raise. Oh, asking for that raise, that's not, I'm not comfortable, that's an awkward conversation. I, I've always been able to raise my debt on it. Yeah, but this is the new Well, how? We're in the middle of a recession, and your credit rating will plummet if you continue to go along this path. I almost had it. I cut my budget by three hundred and eighty dollars. Are you kidding? I'm sorry, Mr. Smith. I can't help you. I'm very sorry. My wife is gonna lose it. I mean, three hundred and eighty dollars is bad enough. This is gonna end our marriage. We stopped talking to each other for a month. The baby was totally freaked out. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. All right. Our kids a blessing. She's got plenty of time to do all of this, right? Absolutely. Are we all set? You're all set. All right. Let's go, kiddo. We gotta meet mommy at the car store. Okay, Mr. Schumer. Thank you. Enjoy. There's your annual pop there. I think the video's almost done anyway. So household debt 140,000, income 21, spending. Take on some new debt and cut that. That was his story. Does that sound like a good place to be? Yeah, whose perspective? <laughs> whose perspective is going to care about that? Who was the kid in the video, by the way? What, Kaylee? Oh, I thought you were, you did kind of this, and that, so I thought you had the answer. When that time bomb explodes 18 years from now, I'm 48 right now, so I'm like 68. You guys won't even be retirement age, right? <laughs> so another 40 years from now, I'm 98. I'm expected to be dead. You guys, on the other hand, are 20-ish. 40 years from now, you're 60. Who was the kid in that video? You. Right? I'm getting to enjoy the debts that are being taken on now. I'm the dad, but we have what's called generational transfers that go on when we have stuff like unfunded liabilities. We're basically passing on the spending that we enjoyed today to go into a bigger debt limit to raise our debt limit. I get to enjoy that money today and then tomorrow, when it needs to be paid, I'm dead, you're alive, you're paying. Because it's the government, they can force you to pay. You're like, I don't want to pay. Well, too bad, you go to jail. <coughs> right? So that's the whole forced thing. So that's a little, uh, little place where we're going here with the debt and deficit. So comments on the video. Let me finish off the video, and then we'll open up. I don't know if there's much more. Oh, there we go. So there's the 14 trill. This is an old number, by the way. Does anybody know what we're at now? No, 20. 20 trill, yeah. Well, we're, we're about at our size of our income. So this video is old. We'll, we'll get into the actual numbers when we get into um, our, our next material coming up here. But So 14 trillion, 
uh, income, spending, whatever, down the road. So that was kind of playing off of actual numbers. All right, so that uh, um, video helped me tee up a little advertisement for next Tuesday at 6 p.m. You guys are going to have an extra credit opportunity. Um, so we're going to have a debate on the national debt. What's the problem with the national debt? So there's going to be three debate teams, uh, myself and a student, Nate Hamilton, one of, the e one of my econ majors that's already been in your chair already. So our two graduate assistants, uh, Jacob and Jason, Jacob's the one that subbed for class that one time. You uh, probably haven't met Jason, you might have seen her. Jason's a, a she, so it'd be my two graduate assistants with the Gordon Institute. And then, for the first time on the debate stage for fun like this, is Dr. Ryan Lewis, our communications guy. So he's going to debate part of it. So that's kind of the three teams, and he's going to be with, uh, I don't know her personally, I think it's Sydney Coleman, maybe? Does anybody know Sydney Coleman? Is that somebody? Yeah. Okay, so Sydney Coleman, I think, is going to be Ryan's partner. So that's the three teams. Uh, Nate and I, uh, Sydney and Ryan, and Jacob and Jason. And so that'll be just from 6 o'clock to 7 o'clock, Tuesday, uh, this coming Tuesday, and we'll have some extra credits. So you'll see some stuff coming in the uh, mailings and stuff. The whole university is invited, and we'll have popcorn and snacks and kind of fun like we did the last, last term with the debate. All right, um, so let's see, let's roll off with this question here. In a democracy, political decisions are made by majority rule, mutual agreement, voluntary exchange, A, B, or C? A. A, right? So that's all we get out of democracy. Um, sometimes we really hang our hat on democracy, but there's some problems with majority rule, namely the minority. What about that? Um, so that's one thing that doesn't happen in the market exchange. Okay, so a little bit more on the debt and deficits for module 10. So government transfers, take from the rich, give to the poor, all that stuff. So you can call this video government transfers. Remember those secondary effects, the unintended consequences of government intervention we've been talking about? Beth's uncle was another good example. Unemployment benefits are meant to help people pay their bills while they seek a new job. That's a laudable goal. But the secondary effects we saw in the video show the frailty of human nature often comes into play. As Uncle Stan is asking, why work when you can collect a check and still do your own thing? Uncle Stan didn't set out to cheat, but the alignment of incentives has allowed him to figure out at least one way to effectively game the system. The impact of unemployment compensation and other transfer programs is often quite different than what was intended. Incentives matter. When the personal benefits of not working are higher and the costs lower, people work less and output is reduced. Remember, it is output of goods and services people value that determines their living standards. Transfer payments tax some individuals, that is, takes money from some individuals in order to transfer income to others. In recent years, income transfers have grown rapidly, and they now constitute nearly half of government expenditures. On the surface, it seems like transfer payments would be an easy way to help the poor and reduce income inequality, but this has not been the case. As the transfers have grown, the poverty rate has stagnated and income inequality has increased. How can this be? A sizable share of the transfers are directed toward recipients in middle and upper income brackets. However, even when assistance is directed toward those with low incomes, welfare, unemployment, and other programs often reduce the incentive of recipients to work and maintain their skills, making it even more difficult for them to move up the job ladder. As a result, transfer programs often have unintended consequences. The war in poverty illustrates this point. Prior to the war in poverty programs initiated in 1965, the poverty rate in the United States had been declining for two decades. But 
Shortly after the increase in transfers accompanying this program, the poverty rate leveled off and it has changed little since the late 1960s. Economics indicates that it's far more difficult to improve the well-being of a group of people with income transfers than is generally recognized. This module provides additional details on this seemingly paradoxical point. Okay, so transfer payments are part of it. You're back to the, uh, the graph. There it is. One, yeah. One more. Yeah, so what's known as the war on poverty, that's when we started doing like uh, the housing projects that maybe you've heard of that have been kind of um, some areas that uh, will now have been torn down a lot in different places, but that was part of the war on poverty that Lyndon B. Johnson uh, initiated back in the, in the 60s. And so the point they were making is that there was both, there was reductions in poverty that were starting, and then we've been pretty pretty flat. <laughs> okay, so um, what did he say transfer payments make of government spending? Half. half. Yeah. And I got bad news for you. It's actually higher than half now. Again, I, I don't know when they recorded that video, what tax year they were looking at. Um, but it, it's floated up over 60%, 60 to 60, and even during the uh, 2008 financial crisis at times it was as high as 67%. So we looked at some of that stuff too. So again, protective function, what's the other key one? Protective, productive, and redistributive. So now if we think about, we're building roads and bridges, we're hiring police officers, we have a court system in place, Right, so we've got some of those protective functions and all of that stuff. Of our government budget, which of those three functions is the biggest? Redistributing. So that's been mostly what, um, or that's where at least our dollars are going, tax dollars are going um, currently. Um, here is a snapshot of In the United States from 1960 to 2000, whatever, pretty much present day. So, what's a deficit? What is the deficit? So, in 1985, we had a deficit. That was during the Reagan era, by the way. So, President Ronald Reagan was in office. And we had a deficit. Spending more than we make. Spending more than we make. So the government spending, which is spending on the protective function, the productive function, and the redistributive function, that spending exceeds how much do they make is what Jacob said. So where how does the government make money? Tax revenue. Tax revenue. So in terms of tax collections coming in, we don't charge enough taxes to pay for our spending, which creates a deficit. When we have a deficit, how do we pay for that spending we didn't have enough money for, enough tax revenue for? Government bonds. Government bonds, good. I was pulling out my little trinket of toys here. One of these, right? So Trump runs out of money. I owe you $1 million, sell it to Wall Street, sell it to China, we don't care. This bond goes out into the financial system. And now we have enough money to pay for these programs, protective, productive, and redistributive functions that the government's doing. One time we had this. So if we do this year after year after year since 1960, what happens to the national debt? Does it go up or down? It increases. The more of these, this is the borrowing, right? The more of these floating around the globe, that is the debt that we owe. That is the national debt that we'll be talking a lot about here as we wind down the term. So uh, questions or comments there? 
And we got this debt deficit uh, talk coming up. That'll be kind of exciting. All right, so question, what has been the effect on budget surpluses and deficits of the Keynesian revolution in economic thought? So to kind of refresh your memories from what we did on the last chapter, Keynes, was he the big government guy or the hands-off guy? Hayek and Keynes, big government guy. What year did he do his work? Uh, Roughly? 40s. 40s, yeah, you're in the right ballpark. So 1936, he wrote the general theory. So we're coming out of the Great Depression. He's basically saying, hey, we can make the economy a better place by using government as an instrument for doing that. And so that was kind of the Keynesian revolution of, of let's use government to help make the world a better place in terms of spending. Now, what's the answer here? What's been the effect of Keynes' work over, since 1936? Politicians work hard to achieve budget surpluses. Politicians avoid budget deficits whenever possible. Or politicians routinely approve budget deficits. See, right? That's the whole point. So the public choice nature of that is that when politicians take office, the incentive structures change in political markets. And so we might not get the same types of advantages uh, that we do in the market system. Okay, uh, we're gonna wrap up with this one. So this is uh, subsidies. So taxes are the government taking your money Subsidies is just the government giving you money, right? So subsidies is our next uh, section here, 3.7. I started to get the wind, just if I'm afraid my walk has become rather sillier lately. Second wonder is where I'm going. <laughs> I wish someone would pay me to spend more of my time silly walking. This would add greatly to my happiness, possibly yours too. At least I think. But I haven't figured out a way to get paid for silly walking unless I can get a government grant. I have a silly walk, and I'd like to obtain a government grant to help me develop it. I see a medical silly walk. Yes, certainly, yes. If there were government subsidies for silly walks, if they gave me money to develop new walks, for example, or promised to buy a certain number of walks I created, there would be more silly walks than there are now. Isn't that a great idea? It's not particularly silly, is it? We've got no backing up to make it very silly. You probably think it's not a great idea that these silly walks are, well, they're silly. But even if you agree with me that silly walks benefit society, there would be good reason for most subsidies for them. If people aren't willing to pay me to develop silly walks with their own money, it says people don't value them as much as other things I can do. I can flip hamburgers, walk dogs, sell used cars, or teach economics. Things people would pay for voluntarily. We'll get more silly walks for subsidies, but they'll be worth less to people than they cost to produce. That means the subsidies would waste resources. What about other more serious subsidies? Defense, social security, health, housing, education, city walls. <laughs> what about subsidies for food? You might have seen a bumper sticker that says no farms, no food, or something like that. Some people have argued that food subsidies are necessary to ensure food security. Without subsidies, they say, we won't have enough food. But subsidizing food production is a lot like subsidizing silly ones. Yes. We'll get more food, but the subsidies won't waste resources. It'll be food that costs more to produce than it's worth. All right, get your comments there on silly walks. Okay, I call it the silly walk. I'll give you my best here. <laughs> All right, so I think he made some interesting comments on valuation of the silly walk. So if the government subsidizes silly walks, we'll have incentives for people to do some silly walks, right? But why did he say, why don't we have silly walks now? Yeah, do we pay people to do silly things? 
Yes. Yeah, of course. Of all the comedians and right. So so there might be a market for silly walks. But if we don't see a lot of people doing that or some entertainers specialize it, so when the market is in place without that, people will do activities or not do activities. As he said, was there benefits potentially to society of people silly walking? I mean, we might get a laugh or two, right, when we're walking down the streets on Main Street. Oh, look at that idiot. What's that walk all about? And we kind of chuckle and we have a good laugh. So there are positive benefits to silly walks. But that doesn't mean that we should subsidize silly walks because does everybody value it? The market system through voluntary exchange gets a price on silly walks, and if there's not a lot of people silly walking, we might want them doing other things. Apparently, their time is more valuable spent doing other activities than silly walks. All right, we'll call it a day there. Turn in your notes up front. If any of you didn't pick up your notes from lab from previous times, uh, I have them up here, so come up and get them if you were gone last time or whatever. Alicia, you have some up here. Okay, you guys, if you can do it right now, let me, uh, they were, they were messing around with the system. She has sent a uh, different, she created a code, and I don't know why it would be closed right now, but, uh, try this code right now. Oh, yeah, try this code, you guys. They did, I had to work with them a lot last week on trying to get the student code to work. So they finally gave me the Russ M just as a worker. So they might have closed it down. Let's see if it works. Not working. Okay. Not working. And so did you guys try before? And, and what browsers are you guys on? Chrome. Chrome and I thought it was Okay, you tried the other ones too. Okay, let me uh, give them a call. So the Rust M is not working. We got at least a handful of you that worked before, obviously. <laughs> um, okay, let me uh, send out, get that corrected. Look for an email from me later today. Um, if you don't see an email by just even later on this afternoon, shoot me an email. And I'll try to give you an update. Okay. But otherwise, I'm going to try to get that resolved right away. Friday, yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Ye